Jane, thanks so much for joining us today. I'm super excited. I have Coach Michael Taylor with us, and he is a motivational speaker, an entrepreneur, an author, and a radio show host. He helps people around the world attain more success in the midst of great challenges. He is equipped with sound consulting principles, as well as validated techniques that produce amazing results. He wrote a book called Adversity is Your Greatest Ally. And in the book, he makes the case for viewing those hardships as stepping stones to a better future. Uh, Michael Taylor is a high school dropout who endured crushing adversities. And today he's a successful entrepreneur. And as I said before, a motivational speaker, radio and TV show host, and an author. And he uses his experience to help others find their way forward. And today we are so honored to be speaking with him and he is going to be talking about a lot of the key areas that he's been through and where he's been through to get to where he is today. So hi, Michael, thank you so much. Hello, for Carol. Well, thanks for the opportunity to share this positive message because obviously we, we turn on the television and we see all the negativity and chaos and a lot of people assume that you know the world is on the path of destruction. I personally have to be an irrepressible optimist, and I don't think there's ever been a better time to be alive than right now. And one of the things I do is I share some some tips, if you will, on how to navigate this thing called life. That sounds brilliant. <laughs> so if you could just tell us, I mean, we're interested in digging into your book. Um, obviously, I read it, and it's a great read. It has so many like nuggets of information that like things we may know but we don't cohesively put together and simple things like gratitude and love and respect and all those things and how they are stepping stones to help you that helped you to get to the place you are today so with that said just give us a little background about your life and what you've been through and let us know what motivated you to write this book well, since we're talking about adversity, I'd like to just sort of share my life story because it began with lots of adversity. You see, I was born in the inner city projects of Corpus Christi, Texas, to a single mom with six kids. And we were basically the poster children for poverty back in the 60s. Government housing, government assistance. We were extremely, extremely poor. And yet, although we may not have had money, I had a mom who instilled in me a lot of values. And the one thing that she taught me was that if I set my mind to something, there was no one that could keep me from accomplishing it except myself. And that was probably the most important lesson I learned at a very early age. And so when I was six years old, my oldest sister became extremely ill. And so my mom had to take me, one of my brothers and one of my sisters to live with our father because of my sister's illness. And my parents had divorced when I was really young. So I really didn't know my dad. And so, she takes me to live with my dad, who actually happened to live with his mother, who was my grandmother. And she was the grandmother from hell. And I mean that literally. Oh. And so for seven years, from six to 13, I experienced unimaginable trauma and abuse. Mm -hmm. Don't need to go into details, but if you can imagine the worst childhood a child could have and multiply that by 10, that was my childhood from six to 13. At the age of 13, my mom was able to reunite our family, and so I moved back with my mom. And so now I'm moving into junior high, getting to, to high school. I get to high school, and I go to this seminar, and this guy convinces me that I can get rich selling vacuum cleaners. So I decide to drop out of high school to get rich selling vacuum cleaners, which is a really poor decision, by, by the way. And so after several months, I never sold a single vacuum cleaner. But fortunately for me, I secured a job with a building supply company. And I worked extremely hard. I climbed the corporate ladder. And at the age of 22, I was the youngest manager in the history of this particular company. And so at the age of 23, I was living the American dream. I had the house, the wife, the 2.5 kids and all of that. And by society standards, I had succeeded. And then within about a six, six and a half year time frame, my American dream turned into the American nightmare as I went through a divorce, mm -hmm. bankruptcy, foreclosure, a deep, deep state of depression. 
And I was homeless for two years living out of a car. And so during the darkest period of my life, I received a miracle. I was sitting up late one night because I was too depressed to sleep. And I remember sitting at the edge of my bed and I was looking across the room at my bookshelf and I happened to notice that every book on my bookshelf had something to do with making money or getting rich. And as I looked at those books, this question just popped in my head. And it was this, Michael, what if you took all the energy and effort you've used in trying to get rich and simply figure out how to be happy? That simple question literally changed my life in an instant. That's something, so profound. Something in me shifted. And all of a sudden, I had this, my depression lifted. And I had this clarity that I was going to be able to rebuild my life. And as a result of that question, I stopped reading books on business and making money. And I started reading philosophy and psychology and metaphysics and spirituality and personal development. So I went on this amazing journey of transformation. And so fortunately for me, I was able to rebuild my life. And I decided that I wanted to start sharing the lessons that I had learned along the way. And that's when I began writing. And so a few years ago, I just had this idea about a title for a book, which was Adversity is Your Greatest Ally, which some people sort of back up when I say that, because who likes adversity? Right. But for me, it really made sense, because when I looked at all the adversities that I had overcome and how I was able to now look at those adversities and see that every adversity, no matter how difficult and painful, had actually brought me a gift and a lesson. And so I want to share those lessons with others. And that's why I wrote the book, Adversity is Your Greatest Ally, How to Use Life Challenges as Stepping Stones to Live the Life of Your Dreams. That is truly profound. Uh, when you say that you had like this epiphany, uh, you instantly felt like the depression lift from you at that moment? I like to think of it as the voice of my higher self, because I really believe that's what it was. Because when the question hit me, it was as though I heard a voice outside of myself. It was like someone was in the room with me. And when I heard the question, something, and I can't explain it, something in me just went, whoa. It was like some people call it a light bulb moment, mm -hmm. but something internally, and I know it's, it's spiritual, I mm -hmm. connected with something, and that's what began my journey of transformation. Do you think that it was a higher power or just your consciousness like becoming aware? Well, I personally believe that we are all connected to something greater than ourselves. You can call it whatever you want to call it. You can call it God. You can call it spirit. You can call it whatever that is. That's what it was. It was, I choose to use the term higher self, which I believe we are all as human beings, simply expressions of the divine. And so the divine literally gave me a message. And I fortunately listened and I heard the message that it gave me. That's truly incredible. That alone is, is inspiration enough for some folks that are struggling right now. Um, in your book, you talk about these keys, right? And you, you say that, you, you stress this point that we must assume 100% of the responsibility for our lives. And um, so how can you convince this to someone who had a terrible and difficult life, much like your own, and, you know, due to maybe circumstances outside of themselves, how do they turn, what's the first step for them to turn their adversities into allies well it's possibly one of the most difficult things we'll ever do as human beings because there's a part of us which some people may refer to as our ego that is going to do everything in its power to keep us trapped in our smallness if you will and so it is the ego's job to try to keep you safe and so that's why a lot of people are afraid to take risk a lot of people are afraid to get out of their comfort zone because their ego is saying, no, that's not safe. Stay safe, stay in this place. But you cannot transform your life if you're unwilling to take 100% responsibility for your life turning out the way you want it to. 
Now, unfortunately, too many people get trapped in this blame game. And we blame our parents. We blame our ex-wives. You know, we blame our lack of education. We blame lack of money. We blame our race. There's lots of blame going on. Mm -hmm. But until we put a line in the sand and cross over and say, you know what? If it's to be, it's up to me. Until we take that stand, we will never transform our lives. So the first step that any person has to take is to simply decide. I want to transform my life. And we have to understand that I can't change anybody's life except mine. My book literally can't change your life, but you can. The book is simply a tool that you can use to support you in transforming your life. But ultimately, as a human being, we must first and foremost take 100% responsibility because the, th the amazing thing about that is as soon as we do that and declare that, we gain our power back. When we stop being victims, when we stop feeling victimized, then we, we lay the foundation to connect to that which is greater than ourselves and we become the master of our own destinies. I couldn't agree with that statement more, especially in this day and age where victimhood is looked upon as like a badge of honor. Do you know what I mean? Sure. And, and it's just prevalent everywhere in society. And um, I, I couldn't agree with that whole statement more than I do at this moment. It's, it's really, truly words of wisdom. Now, you also talk about gratitude. And that's a big one. It's a big one. And in your book, you mention um, making post-it notes in your car, right? You were, you were sleeping in the back of your car. Can you talk about that? And also, how can folks that are in a situation much like yours be grateful for anything? Like, how do they start? Well, we have to understand, first of all, the importance of human emotion. When we connect with our, what I call our interior, our souls, if you will, it, it's, it's primarily about feeling. And so when we're in a really dark place and things seem hopeless, it's really difficult to feel gratitude. It's difficult to see beyond our temporary situation that we might be in. But what I've come to know is that no matter how dark or how depressed a person might be, if for a moment they can shift their minds to gratitude, gratitude and depression cannot coexist in the same space. So when I was living out of a car, I was sleeping in the back seat. And on the back of the seats in front of me, I had a bunch of sticky notes. And every day I would write five things that I was grateful for. And I just stick them up on the back of my seat. And so it got to a point where in doing that on a regular basis, it opened me up to new possibilities. I no longer focused on the things that were wrong. I started focusing on the things that were right. And in doing so, it opened my mind and imagination to create solutions to a lot of the challenges that I was dealing with. I honestly believe that, as mentioned, we are connected to something that's divine. Mm -hmm. And so when we allow ourselves to feel positive emotions, that lets us know we're connected to that, whatever you want to call it. When we experience negative emotions, and let's make a distinction, positive and negative is not good or bad. It's just energy. Positive energy attracts positive. Negative energy attracts negative. So when we're depressed, we're exuding negative energy. Therefore, we will attract negative to us. By shifting to gratitude, we shift that energy. And now we're starting to attract positive energy. So a simple exercise that anyone can do, no matter what your situation is, is to simply write five things you're grateful for. And when you're smack dab in the middle of adversity, this can be really difficult. When I first started, it wasn't easy to do, but I can assure you, I can promise you, I can guarantee you, if you will simply focus your attention on that which you are grateful for, 
in that moment, in that moment, you'll feel that feeling of gratitude and you'll start to sense, wait a minute, maybe there is hope. Maybe I can get out of this situation. So let me continue to focus on this that's working and what's right. And I can assure you that the universe will support you in that. And what do you say to the person that, because I recently read a book where somebody was asked about gratitude and they said they had nothing to be grateful for. What, do you, what would you tell someone like that? If you're breathing, you have something to be <laughs> grateful for. Quite literally. If you can see, you have something to be grateful for. If you have all of your limbs, <laughs> you have something to be grateful for. Obviously, if you have a roof over your head, you've got something to be grateful for. I had a car as my roof. I had something over my head. I had something to be grateful for. Once again, the ego mind will try to convince you otherwise. It will try to talk you out of everything that's right because that's its job. So you have to be willing to override, if you will, the negative conditioning of the ego, which is simply, again, trying to keep you safe. The ego is not a bad thing. See, a lot of people see the ego as a bad thing. The ego's primary job is to keep you safe. That's what it's trying to do. The only reason the ego becomes overactive is because we've experienced some pain of some in some form, mm -hmm. and the ego has created defense mechanisms to try to protect you. Mm. That's the ego's job. So when we can quiet the ego, and, and here's, here's, a, here's a, a visual that I use. Imagine when you're born, you are born into this empty white room, and there's two of you. There's what's called your higher self, and there's your ego self. And in this white room, there's a cot, a little bed, okay? When you're born, your ego is laying on that cot, and you're walking around, and you're experiencing the world, and you're operating from your higher self. You're operating from pure consciousness. As little children, you're completely conscious and aware. But what happens is, as human beings, when we experience pain, what happens is the ego gets up and protects you, and you lay down. So the ego is now controlling everything to protect you. That's its job. And your higher self is now on the back burner, if you will. It's in the background. And it's still there. It's always there. But what's happening is your ego mind is now controlling everything. When we start doing our inner work, what we do is we quiet the ego mind and we get it to lay back down on the couch, mm. on the bed, and we stand up and then our higher self expresses everything. And so every time we grow, it's just a matter of letting the ego lay down. But the ego is always going to be a part of you. It is a part of you. Not bad. It's just a part of you. But it's a matter of attention and awareness. When we shift to higher self and have, excuse me, have that awareness, then we're less likely to fall into negative thinking, bad behaviors, because yeah. we're connected to that source. That makes so much sense. I love that explanation. You talk also a lot in your book about the mind-body connection. How does that work? Why is that important for folks to understand when dealing with adversity? Well, if you will accept the idea that as a human being, we are three-part beings, body, mind, and spirit. When we say mind, a lot of people think brain. They think this massive muscle in your head that thinks and rationalizes and so forth. That's not the mind. The mind is actually a tool that the soul uses. The soul is the essence of who you are. Another way to look at it is your ego could be considered part of the mind. Mm -hmm. The soul is the higher self. And so what we have to understand is that when we're born, our mind is like a tape record, a video recorder. Between birth and seven, this video recorder is recording everything. If you think about a child when they're really young, you notice they don't forget anything. Mm. <laughs> 
They remember everything. It's like five days ago, you know, I told my son that I was going to buy him a piece of candy and he hadn't forgot. Dad, remember you said, you see, because he's just recording. He's just picking up. He's receiving all this stimulus. But what happens is all of those experiences are now going into our subconscious mind. When they go into our subconscious mind, when we get to seven, eight, and beyond, then we start using our conscious mind, which is our rational mind. Mm -hmm. But we don't understand that the subconscious programming that we receive between birth and seven is literally controlling everything. The subconscious mind is a thousand times more powerful than the conscious mind. So imagine this. You're driving your car to work. Have you ever drove your car to work and you don't even remember how you got there? Autopilot, yes. <laughs> You're on autopilot. Why? Because your subconscious mind is running the program. Mm -hmm. And so when we allow ourselves to understand this concept, then what we have to do is understand that the mind is just the tool. And we can reprogram our subconscious mind. We can change because in our subconscious mind are where we store beliefs. Mm. Our beliefs are the filters through which we think. So if we have a bunch of negative subconscious beliefs, most of us were going to think negative. If you've ever met someone that's always negative, everything's bad, mm -hmm. that person has negative beliefs that are at a subconscious level. Well, see, every human being can change, can be transformed. How do you do that? You change your subconscious beliefs about who you are. When you are willing to do that work and challenge some of the beliefs and assumptions that you have about yourself, then you lay the foundation for being fully expressed as who you are as a human being. Now, I think one of the things that we, we don't pay attention to or don't give enough credit to is the fact that between birth and seven, which are our most formative years, when we experience trauma, and trauma does not necessarily have to mean things like sexual abuse or physical violence. Trauma could be your dad telling you that he's disappointed in you. Mm. And as a six-year-old, you internalize that, and all of a sudden, your belief becomes you're not worthy. This becomes your programming, because your dad said a simple statement that you internalized. It created a belief in you that you're not worthy. And guess what? All your life, you're grown, as a grown-up, you're doing everything trying to feel worthy. That makes so much sense. And until you go in and, re and change that programming, and you learn to love yourself unconditionally just for the amazing human being that you are, those unconscious programs will run your life. And that's why it's important to do this type of work, this inner work that I'm talking about, that I talk about throughout this book. Mm -hmm. One of the things I talk about is the power of making peace with your past. Now, I mentioned that I had a very traumatic childhood. And again, I mean that in a literal sense. And so there's a thing, there's a guy named Tim Kelly, wrote an amazing book about uh, purpose. But he said something that I thought was really profound. He says, we all have what he calls a sacred wound. Meaning there's something that happens and it's usually between birth and seven. He says something happens. And in that moment, we make a decision that there's something wrong with us. And it is that sacred wound that sets all addictive behaviors in, in place. So for me, because of that experience of my mom at six years old, taking me to live with my dad. At six years old, you gotta remember, you're not rationally thinking, you're, you're feeling more than anything. Sure. So what happened was my mom was literally God to me. And so when she took me to live with my dad in my six year old mind and heart, I felt abandoned. Mm. So what I created was this belief that people who love you will leave you. That six-year-old experience was my sacred wound. Now, I was able to go back 
to that six-year-old boy and heal that trauma. And I did that through a process with a guy named John Bradshaw, who unfortunately is no longer with us. But he did these amazing workshops called Healing Your Inner Child. Yes, in your book, you have a lot of great links and uh, reference points for folks, too. So I want to make sure they know that that not only will they get all of your wisdom and advice, but there's also a lot of great information in there. Lots of lots of resources if you're if you're yes. committed to your transformation. And so, but with John Bradshaw's work, see, because here's the thing: as I mentioned, I was very successful at a ver very early age. But as I went back and started doing this work, what I found out is I was literally driven by shame. I had what John Bradshaw calls toxic shame. I felt so unlovable that I thought by being successful, people would love me. I was going to ask you, how do you account for the first part of your success in life? I mean, and then you had, you know, the success and then a crash and burn. So that's what you attribute that to then. That's exactly what it was. And so we have to understand that the universe is perfect. <laughs> No matter where you are right now in your life, I can assure you that the universe is perfect and you're exactly where you're supposed to be. You just have to trust me on this. But what happens is you have to ask yourself, are you open, open to understanding that the universe loves and supports you and that's all it can do? That's a really difficult concept for most people to grasp because we've been taught to believe and this God that's up in the sky and he's yes. taking notes of our lives and we're born sinners and we've got all this stuff. But in reality, even the good book says we were made in the image and after the likeness of God. How can you be born a sinner if you're made in that image and that image is love? Right. And so and we have to be willing to do that inner work to connect to that divine part yes. of us. And it is a lot of work, but the nice thing about your book is that it guides you through a step-by-step -step process of like, okay, this is where you need to start and slowly, you know, progress to the point where you go through all this healing. And now you talk about therapy a lot in your book too. And a lot of folks are very resistant to therapy. Um, and I think it's important for, for folks to know that it can be an amazing healing tool. And it certainly took you to the place that you are today. Can you just walk us through some of the justification of how you discovered that you needed to go through this healing process? Well, first of all, and especially for men, the three most difficult words for any man to say is, I need help. <laughs> and that is part of the male conditioning of our society. Mm -hmm. And so obviously women have that same experience, but it's really difficult for us to say we need help because once again, if you look at, if you think about what I just said about the ego, see the ego is doing everything in its power to protect us and to keep us trapped and keep us stuck. And so it doesn't understand what unconditional love feels like. It doesn't understand its divinity. All it knows is that there's pain and suffering out there, so I want to keep you from that. Well, when we begin this process, you must understand that there are only two things that will cause a person to change. Number one is pain. Number two is what I call divine discontent, which is an internal feeling, a knowing that something's just not right. We may not have words for it, we may not understand it, but intuitively we just know for example when i was married and living the dream there was a part of me that knew something was off i couldn't explain it because i was on that societal roller coaster that said i was supposed to have this 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 and that and i had all of those things so why wasn't i happy well you take that divine discontent add to it the pain of going through a divorce, the bankruptcy, the foreclosure, losing my kids, all of that. See, that's, that's traumatic, obviously. But for me, I was in so much pain, I didn't have a choice. It was either get help or die. I had started reading all these books. 
I had all this knowledge, if you will, this information. But again, I read a book by John Bradshaw called Healing the Shame That Binds You. And in that book, he talked about the importance of what he calls creating an interpersonal bridge with another human being. He said the only way you'll heal is through that interaction with another human being. And what I realized when I read that is I had read all these books and I had the knowledge, the understanding, but I was still in pain and I didn't know how to heal that. And when I read that statement about creating that interpersonal bridge, then I realized that I needed to see someone. The problem was I had a huge issue with trust. Mm. I didn't trust people. And so to be willing <laughs> To move against that fear of trusting someone. And the only reason I was able to do it, I believe, is because the pain was so great. And so my saving grace were my kids. Because I, I, I contemplated taking my own life. But when I thought about my kids, I knew there was no way that I could leave them that way. And I said, whatever it takes, I have to be here for my kids. And that's what was the final, the straw that broke the camel's back, if you will, that challenged me to go to therapy because I needed to be there for them. And it allowed me to break through my fear of being vulnerable with someone and dealing with and addressing the trauma and the pain that I was in. So you had a higher purpose outside of yourself that you knew you needed to go get help and that's when you reached out to a therapist. Um, you talked about trust. How does one develop this trust with a therapist, especially men? Because I know if I ever told my husband, hey, you know, I think you need to go see a shrink, he would probably laugh for 10 minutes. Because some men are just very, men more than women, because women are more emotional and open with their like we, we like to talk a lot more than men do, converse. So it's easier, I think, for women in therapy than it is for men. <clears throat> what advice do you have for the guys out there that um, really need therapy but are just pushing back against it? Well, once again, we have to understand cultural conditioning. We live in a culture that has conditioned men to believe that they aren't supposed to feel. We're taught that women are emotional. The fact of the matter is men are just as emotional as women. Mm -hmm. We feel at the same levels. We feel the same emotions. We feel at the same depth. But we don't express those feelings because our culture says we're not supposed to. Men are comfortable with anger. <laughs> yes. Very comfortable with anger. But a lot of men don't understand and can't even connect with their sadness. They don't know how to express fear. Because men aren't supposed to be afraid. They don't understand that it's okay to feel joy. But we can do anger because our culture says that's okay. Were you like that prior to therapy? Well, yes and no. I've always been emotionally expressive. I have no problem with affection and stuff like that. But what I didn't know how to do especially in relationship, which was to be vulnerable and to be emotionally available to women. And the reason that my relationship and my marriage didn't work out was because I didn't know how to share that part of myself. I was that Mr. Nice guy that did everything right on the outside. Mm -hmm. I was very nice. I was very attentive. I didn't cheat, you know, those types of things. But I didn't know how to open my heart to, another, to, to a woman. That was foreign to me, as it is for a lot of men. But the key, and in, in one of my I wrote a book called The New Conversation with Men. And in the book, I talk about what I call the five illusions of manhood. And the first illusion is that to be a man, you must be non-emotional and disconnected. And that's why so many men struggle, because they're trapped in that illusion that that's what men are supposed to do, which is not feel. So when a man gets courageous enough to do this work, to really start healing, 
Mm -hmm. and then start sharing in a way that isn't blaming or shaming men, then it creates a safe space for men to share and open up. And it's difficult and challenging, once again, because of the culture, the masculine yes. culture we currently, currently live in. But as the optimist that I am, I'm really excited because I think what we're seeing is there is a breakdown in the old paradigm of masculinity oh, yes. because it's no longer sustainable. And we see things like, you know, the Me Too movement and all the sexual assault cases and all of this. And it looks like men are the bad guys. Well, I say the good news is, is that we're bringing these things to light and men are now starting to talk about it. And it's actually the result of women who took a stand for equality and said, hey, look, we're equals. And we no longer want to have these old roles, stay home and pregnant and, you know, all that kind of right. stuff. And so a lot of people don't understand that, you know, in this country, for the first time in our history, there are more women in the workforce than men. There's also more women graduating from college than men. If you look at our political landscape, there are more women now than ever that are moving into male spaces. And so it's a shift. It's a positive shift. And I don't think people see this, but it's a positive shift because what we're recognizing is that we're all human. We're all equals. And so I think men are struggling because the old masculine culture is really hard to break through. Right. In your book, you talk about um, the three R's. And they are researching, reporting, and creating results, right? Can you explain how that works together and how that can help people overcome adversity? Well, there's a concept called um, imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome comes from the belief that we aren't good enough to share if we don't have degrees or certain titles or labels. And I struggled with the word expert because I really don't like that word because I've listened to some experts and I just scratch my head and I go, seriously, <laughs> as an expert? Well, for me, I was really struggling as an author because at the beginning, I didn't feel that I was qualified because our society says you should have a degree and a title and all of that. Well, there's a guy named Brendan Burchard who says, look, for those of you who are struggling with this word expert, he says, here's what an expert is. An expert is simply someone who researches, reports, and gets results. Mm -hmm. So if you're willing to read and learn, which is your research, and you're willing to share that with others, which is to report, and it creates results in people's lives, you are literally an expert. And so everyone, is an expert. <laughs> Everyone should be an expert of themselves. They should research, report, and create results in their own lives. And that's what having conversations like this do. Absolutely. Absolutely. You, you know, a lot of folks don't realize it takes a lot of work. Uh, as with you, it took years, right, of doing all this work to be the person you are today, but you wouldn't change a a moment of it, am I correct? Well, see, here's the thing. We live in this instant gratification society. Everybody wants it now. Yes. And you have lots of people peddling this quick fix, you know, <laughs> lose 20 pounds in five days and, you know, come to my seminar and, you know, you'll be rich in a week or, you know, there's no such thing as a quick fix. We have to understand some universal, some basic universal laws. And one of the universal laws is what I call the breakdown breakthrough process. If you think about a seed, you plant a seed. It has to grow roots before it's able to break through to express all that it is. That process of building the roots is the breakdown period. It's purposeful. It has a purpose. It's got to set itself so that it's strong. Well, see, when we look at adversity from that perspective, adversity and breakdowns, I believe, are basically preparations for your breakthrough if you're willing to do the inner work. 
And so for me, you know, as mentioned, as I look back over my life and as painful and difficult as it may have been, if I had a chance to do it all over again, I wouldn't change a thing. I couldn't change a thing because I wouldn't be the man that I am today if I did. Mm -hmm. And so fortunately for me, I have been on this journey and I've made that commitment to myself to become the grandest version of myself. And what I can see and identify is every event in my life, I can explain to you why it happened for me to be, the, for me to be this man that I am today. The abuse that I experienced as a child, I can, I, can, I can literally see and understand how it was important for me to go through that so that I could be the man that I am today. And so for me, once again, I have this belief that my definition of God is the divine energy and intelligence that created and is still creating this amazing universe that we live in. Mm -hmm. that's, that's my definition of God. That's how I see God. So when I look at the world from that perspective, that there is this divine energy and intelligence, well, I believe that energy and intelligence is love. If it's love, then the only thing it can do is love. So if I surrender to this idea that this energy and intelligence is love and all it can do is love me, then all of that pain and suffering I went through was done out of love to prepare me to ultimately become the divine expression of God that I was born to be. And so therefore, that's why I assert that every adversity that we go through is literally a stepping stone to living our best life. Now, when folks are in that breakdown period of their lives, they don't see the growth period ahead of them. And I'm sure you didn't either, am I right? You know, right. you knew there was a way out. You, you had that epiphany. You knew that you were climbing your way out of it, but you didn't see obviously where you would be today how do folks maintain the level of hope that they need to climb out of adversity well here's what worked for me <laughs> i had a playlist of about three songs that i call my breakdown theme songs and whenever i felt down discouraged afraid I would play one of these songs. One of those songs is by a guy named Michael Bolton. You know Michael <laughs> Bolton? Of course. <laughs> and the, the song is When I'm Back on My Feet Again. It's a great song. And that song is, for me, a prayer. Because when I was at, in my darkest period, I could listen to that song, and it would touch a part of me that gave me hope, allowed me to focus my attention on the fact that I was going to get back on my feet again. And the key in all of this is trust. Mm. It's trusting that the universe has your back. And that's really difficult for us, once again, because most of us have been conditioned to believe that there's this external force that's looking down and making things happen to us. Mm -hmm. But if we, if, we, if we operate from an interior perspective and understand that nothing is happening to us, it's actually happening through us, then we can give us a different perspective. But I think it's important for everyone to create that playlist of songs that inspire and motivate and makes you feel good. So that when you get into that dark place, you listen to that song and it reminds you that there's light. It reminds you that there's something on the other side. Another one of the songs that I played was by Gloria Estefan, which was coming out of the dark. Mm -hmm. And it had incredible meaning for me um, as I was going through my transformational journey because I had a sense that I was in this dark place, but I was coming out of it. 
and it allowed me to see and to use my imagination, which is something that's extremely important when you're stuck, mm -hmm. to be able to use your imagination to see ahead so that you now have something to move towards. Because when we're depressed, we're looking backwards. We're stuck in the past. Imagination propels us to see the future. And if we can see the future, we can move out of the past. So having those songs to help us in that moment feel a little better and focus our attention on our imagination, that's how we begin climbing out of the dark night of the soul. Wonderful. I love it. You talk about journaling in your book. And journaling seems to be making a resurgence. Um, they're selling so many more journals now, and they're all designer looking. I even bought one of them. Um, why do you recommend journaling as a part of this healing process? And, you know, and if they're you're like looking for a way out of adversity through journaling. How do you account for that? There are very few things that will help you get in touch with your subconscious beliefs like journaling. Journaling to me is one of the most powerful transformational processes that we can go through. And there, I began journaling as a result of going to therapy. The first thing my therapist recommended that I do was to write out everything I remembered about my childhood. Now, I was 38 at the time, I think. And so that was my first assignment after seeing a therapist. And I remember going home and I just started writing everything that I remembered. And mm. I have, in some ways, a photographic memory in that I literally see in my mind's eye, what I was experiencing. I, I, I can't really explain it. It's just that in, in, in my mind's eye, I can see, for example, I can literally draw a floor plan of every place that I've ever lived in. Wow. I can literally say, okay, so the door was here, this room was here. I mean, it's, it's amazing. It's, it's, it's a gift. And so when she told me to go home and write what I remembered, I could remember everything from about four wow. to my adult life. And the way it came out, it came out as though I were playing a movie. I remembered how I felt when my mom took me to go live with my dad. I remember the screaming and the crying and the pain that I felt. And I started writing all that down. And I, I mean, I look at some of my journals and there's tear stains <laughs> all over the paper, just purging all of that pain, just letting that go. And so, again, journaling is, it's, I'd say it's mandatory <laughs> for, for, for yeah, growth. Yeah, it sounds it. It sounds like it really impacted your, your healing. Yeah, it, 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 it changed everything for me. And I've been journaling since 30-something years now. <laughs> I still journal. Oh, and do you have all those journals? You have them all? Absolutely. And what's amazing is when I look at them, and I can see the progression of my growth over the years. Mm -hmm. I can feel the pain at the beginning. And I write about my experience with the, you know, with the therapist and what I learned. And as a matter of fact, there's several books in there <laughs> that I'm going to put together to share some of the lessons that I learned as a result of that. But yeah, journaling is is. It's a way to expedite the healing process mm -hmm. because what it does is it allows you to uncover subconscious beliefs that you forgot about so that you can release them. Now, there's, there's this idea, and this is part of that quick fix society that we live in. Mm -hmm. There's this idea that why should I want to relive that pain? Mm -hmm. And I'll say this. Actually, Carl Jung said this. 
He said, there is no coming to consciousness without pain. People will do anything, no matter how absurd, to avoid facing their own souls. He says, one does not come, become enlightened by imagining figures of light, but by making the darkness conscious. Mm. And so what he's pointing to is that it is my belief that it is trapped emotional energy in us that we have not released that causes most of the pain and suffering in our lives. And journaling helps you purge that. Journaling helps you purge and release that. What about folks that are struggling with journaling that sit down and they just, they're either unconsciously fighting it or they just like wrote, I went to the store today, you know, I had a cup of coffee. I mean, that's not really what journaling should be, right? Well, I would say no, actually, it is good because if you're making the attempt, when you start, the key is starting and committing to it. Because even if you're just writing stuff like I had this for breakfast today, right, right. you're at least focusing your attention. The more you focus your attention, and, and I do believe that there should be some structure of what you're doing. And I talk about some of that in, in the book. But there does need to be some structure. But the key is the commitment to simply write. And so it doesn't have to be this profound revelation at the beginning. It can be, I'm simply going to try to, it's like meditation. When you first start meditating, your mind's going to run all over the place. Yes. And it's just chaotic. And you're like, oh, man, this is crazy. It doesn't work, blah, 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 blah. I'm falling asleep. But the more you do it, the easier it gets. Well, journaling is the same way. If you start, and like I said, I think it's important to have some resources that can focus you on some things to focus on when you're journaling, because you have different intentions for journaling. If you're in a really dark place, journaling about gratitude is a really good tool. Mm -hmm. Just writing down five things that you're grateful for, mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a process of journaling. Because you're, you're programming and you're waking up and you're touching those subconscious beliefs and ideas that you have about yourself. And that's where transformation comes from. So there's no right or wrong way. But it's a commitment that you have to make. And the more you do it, the easier it gets. And I can promise you, eventually you'll start going deeper. So journaling is about the commitment and also... Um a lot of folks think that you have to literally get a book and write in it. But can you clarify for them that you can journal online on your computer, on your laptop as well, that you don't need to be like writing in a book? Whatever you're comfortable with. But here's a, here's a way that will really help you get in touch. If, if, if you're touching the emotional healing process, this is something that I learned from John Bradshaw. When you're journaling and you're journaling about some maybe some traumatic or something painful, mm -hmm. if you write with your non-dominant hand, you bypass the intellect, you bypass the subconscious programming, and you touch your soul hmm. because you are doing something that you're not accustomed to doing. And you really have to pay attention. But I promise you, if you're in a healing process and you're talking about the pain that you experienced, for example, I was writing about the pain I felt as an, uh, a 10 year old. Mm -hmm. And in doing it with my non-dominant hand, obviously it's much more difficult. But somehow, I don't know how it works, but it, it shifts something in you that allows you to touch a part of yourself that you won't experience with your right hand. Because remember, so we're talking, you remember we were talking about subconscious programming, how you drive and you don't yes. really, Well, writing is kind of the same thing. You get this flow of thought and you're just writing, but when you do it non, with your non-dominant hand, you have to be more conscious of what you're writing. And it takes you deeper. So if you have like a, 
a really bad or deep hurt, you you recommend writing physically in a journal as opposed to sitting at a computer. Right. To, okay. I just want to make sure folks understand because if you commit to journaling, you want to do it correctly. And, and this journal, seems to be journaling on a computer can be just as effective as writing. But in that process of healing, my experience has been writing it goes deeper if you're writing it on paper versus doing it on the computer. So it's a lot more cathartic to write yes. something physically. Okay. It just gives folks options mm -hmm. when they're making a decision if they want to journal or not. Um, in closing, do you have any, I mean, your book, like I said, folks have to read it because it's just, you know, it's the type of book you can reread and reread and pick up all these great nuggets of information. Um, is there anything that, of course, we didn't touch on a lot of the concepts in your book, but would you like to share anything else that you think is of value um, in closing with our listeners? Well, first of all, I'll, I'll say be optimistic because there's so much negativity and pessimism out there. It's, it's, it's difficult to break through that, that negativity barrier that we're, we're bombarded with. Mm -hmm. And so turn off the TV, go within. There's a beautiful saying that says, if you don't go within, you'll always go without. <laughs> I love that. Take some time to get in touch with yourself. Get in touch with that authentic part of yourself that if you're watching this, you know what I'm talking about. There's a part of you, because there are no accidents in, it, in a perfect universe, if you're watching this right now, there's a message for you. Mm -hmm. And the message could very well be, it's time for you to begin your inner journey. So there are lots of tools out there that can support you along this journey. Adversity is your greatest ally is just a tool. I think it's a wonderful tool that has lots of tools and resources in it. Yes. And it was a labor of love for me to share, to support others in, in, in using adversities to live extraordinary lives because I know that life was meant to be good, but nobody said it was going to be easy. Mm -hmm. And so, again, I just want to leave uh, your viewers with the idea that become an optimist because there are a lot more things that are right with the world than are wrong with it. That's so true. And it's such a, a simple truth. Um, can folks reach out to you? Like I said, you have a wonderful website. Um, can folks reach out to you if they have any questions or comments or anything they want to ask you? Sure, yeah. They can go on my primary website, which is coachmichaeltaylor.com. Uh, for those who would like a really powerful presentation that I gave based on this topic, they can go to adversityisyourgreatestally.com and gain access to this free. It's like a 40-minute presentation, but it's it's really powerful. Um, it's a live presentation I did um, that has really inspired people around the globe to really look at adversity a little differently. And it talks about some of the things, you know, in the book, you know, the five keys to turning adversities into allies. And it's, it's, it's a, a great tool to get you in sync with yourself. Wonderful. That sounds great. And of course, I'll have all the links in the description to your website and uh, you have a place where they can contact you as well on your website too, right? Yes. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Michael. This has Thank been you, great. I was really engaged every second of our conversation. And thank you so much for sharing your wisdom, your experience with us. And I hope to speak with you again soon someday. The pleasure has been mine. Thank you so much. Thank you.